Ralph Nader presents his thoughts on America's economic and socio-political landscape and provides 17 solutions that he contends will answer several issues facing the country. This is about an hour 15 minutes. Uh, I've just been told by C-SPAN that I'm addressing the most serious audience I've ever addressed <laughs> all these years. And uh, so thank you for coming. This is not an ordinary uh, book. We live in an age of uh, muckraking expose documentaries and an age of muckraking uh, books on almost every abuse in industry and government and who knows what. And yet very little has happened. So we're operating in a kind of asymptotic curve with ex exposés. Years ago, there were far fewer exposés, and more happened. We had people in Congress who took some of these exposés seriously. We had some judges who took some of them seriously. We had people in the White House who signed off on legislation uh, under Lyndon Johnson and Nixon. Nixon was the last Republican to be afraid of liberals. He signed bills he loathed. He signed the Environmental Protection Agency bill, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration bill. He signed the Product Safety bill, and, and he wanted more. He actually was the last president to propose to Congress a minimum incomes plan to reduce poverty and a drug policy plan that focused on rehabilitation, not incarceration. They didn't pass. He also supported voting rights for people here and the District of Columbia, uh, America's foremost colony. Uh, this was Richard Nixon. So when we look back at Richard Nixon, it was some nostalgia. You can see how we've declined uh, since then. And this brings me to this uh, effort in this book, uh, 17 Solutions. Sometimes when we just deal with exposés, they either alarm people, astonish people, anger people, or overwhelm people. And the result is no follow-up. We don't have that many people in Congress or in the courts or in the White House as we did in the 60s and 70s uh, to connect with these exposés when they saw them on TV or the books came out, there were hearings, there was litigation, uh, there were uh, statements from the White House. Uh, we don't have that anymore. And therefore, we can't just rely on exposés. We got to recognize there's a banality now to exposés, although they're very, very important. They're the predicate for doing something and changing something. We've got to focus on solutions that em embody as their rationale the descriptions that come out of the exposés. In that sense, we sort of leap over the mere anger or alarm or feeling overwhelmed, uh, the passivity uh, of it all, and focus people on redirections. Now, we happen to live in a country that's full of problems we don't deserve and solutions we don't apply. And the gap is the democracy gap. The gap is a massive withdrawal from democratic engagement even by the small number of people who used to engage. Not that there's no one who engages. Not that there are people in every community who aren't engaged. But my guess is there are a smaller percentage of people who are in the first stage of engagement, intense, second stage, backup, uh, third stage, showing up for rallies and marches, showing up in city council halls, Half of democracy is showing up. Those of you who are under 30 in this room, you can assail yourself as being a generation that doesn't show up. And you don't show up in part because you've grown up corporate without a fraction of the civic experience of people who are fighting the civil rights battle as students in the South and in other parts of the country putting Earth Day on the map uh, for environmental focus in April 1970, 1,500 uh, events around the country, and <clears throat> being embroiled in controversy over the Vietnam War, uh, student rights on campus, many other 
issues. Those gave students experience. They came back, they talked to students who didn't go out with them. Uh, it was an educational process. They had teach-ins. Uh, they didn't look at screens all the time. They didn't have text messages. They didn't have email. They had to face-to-face -to -face each other. And therefore, you would see at cafeterias arguments and discussion um, about the major confrontations. It did help to have the draft. You're part of the risk. You're part of the solution. Now, so your generation needs to sober up, get out of virtual reality a little more, get into reality, and realize that there's no change without person-to-person -person mobilization in real life. You can get information off the Internet. You can find out of events in the Internet. Nothing happens without real-life exchange, and that's what the Occupy Wall Street tried to show in their three months last year when they had the eye of the mass media. Encampments, 24 hours a day, very, very personal. Now, I can overcome anything in an audience but a little baby. <laughs> and this is about your future, little baby. So sleep away for a while. Now, let me uh, discuss something uh, very personal in, in terms of all of us. The theme of this book is that democracy works, that it's a lot easier than you think, that it takes a lot smaller number of people to lead the way in communities distributed, say, in congressional districts, because Congress is the pivot here for a lot of these redirections. But people make excuses for themselves. These are not people who can barely get through the day because they're so poor. These are people who have time. These are people who have a level of flexibility in their personal life uh, to engage some hours in the, in the civic culture. That's very, very important. But they make excuses for themselves, and those of us who go around the country trying to mobilize people, trying to get, get them out, uh, trying to uh, get them to express their creative civic juices, who can think up of a fraction of the tactics and strategies that are needed. Uh, nobody comes close to being smart as everybody. And here are the excuses. First excuse is why they don't get engaged in pursuing change that they believe in. They're not disagreeing with the change. They believe in it. They see the wrongdoing. They see the need. They see the trust for our children and grandchildren before them. First excuse, they don't have time. Okay. You don't have time. Congratulations, you've dropped out of democracy. And you will have to swallow your grievances as you walk through life. But what if they say they do have time? Second excuse, I don't know how to maneuver. I don't know what the rules are. You go to these meetings, they do Robert's rules. Some of the town lawyers or city lawyers tell you to shut up and sit down. And I don't know how to, how to work it. OK? Well, that's, that's something you can learn. I mean, these are the same people who know how to deal with complex video games who know how to deal with computers, who know how to deal with detailed instructions on how to build their porch or fix their plumbing. Okay, so let's say they have the time and they know the rules or can learn the rules. Excuse number three. Well, you know, I'm a little sensitive, they'll say, and I, I don't like to be smeared. I don't like to be lied about. And, 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 and I don't like to be intimidated, and at work, it can create problems for me. I might not get that promotion. All right, so let's say you get over that. You're not blistered by moonbeams. You live in the USA. You've got constitutional rights. So you've got the time. You can learn about the rules of engagement, and you're not blistered by moonbeams. Here's the final excuse. Well, even if I do this, 
even if a lot of us do this, it won't make any difference. Because the big boys run the show. Because the government is in the pockets of the corporations. And the corporations are in the pockets of the government. So why, why, why worry about it? Why waste your time? Just eat, drink, and be happy. Have a happy private life. Maybe plant the garden. And watch the country and the world head toward the cliffs. Into the abyss. We live at a time, unlike other generations, we can destroy this planet inadvertently. Not just by nuclear war. Inadvertently. And it's not just climate change. So, for those of you who don't want to make excuses, uh, here's my suggestions on how to change. These 17 changes, they're not the, you'll think of others, these 17 solutions... Number one, are largely supported by a majority of the American people now, or if they learned about them, my guess is they would be overwhelmingly supportive of ones they haven't learned about, like speculation tax on Wall Street as part of transforming the tax system. Second, a lot of them are supported by both liberals and conservatives, whether it deals with war, Militarization of Foreign Policy, Patriot Act, Corporate Welfare, and others. Third, it belies this manipulative notion that we're a highly polarized society. Polarized by who? At what level of abstraction and ideology? How polarized are we? Oh, well, some people hate regulation, and some people think it's very important. Well, let me talk to the ones who hate regulation. What is it do you hate about the regulation of the auto industry? Well, I, I just think it, it stifles motiv motivation and it's part of the socialist philosophy of command and control economy. Do you have a car? Yeah. I won't ask you the model. But what if uh, the manufacturer you bought the car from through the dealership discovered a serious defect in all the cars of that model and didn't tell you. Would that bother you, anti-regulatory person? <laughs> well, it depends on the defect. Back stiffens. Well, let's say it's a sticking throttle defect. You know, the kind that overpowers your brake and throws you into a brick wall or another vehicle. Do you think that manufacturer should notify you? Yeah, sure, it's only fair play. All right, what if the manufacturer doesn't want to? Do you think the law should require it? When you get down to where people work, live, play, sleep, raise their children, the pitiless abstractions, as George Will pointed out once, disappear or diminish. One day, George Will was in his home in northwest Washington. He's a syndicated columnist, very conservative, and he's writing out his column for that week, and he's a crash. He rushes out, and on the residential street are two cars crashed into each other and a dead motorist that was ex expelled from the door. He comes back in, tears up his column, and he writes a column saying, we should have mandatory installation of airbags. Enough of these pitiless abstractions. All right. Now, this is not a list of policy wonkish type recommendations, although it has policy recommendations. It tries to, to say, what are the long overdue changes and solutions that we need in this country? What kind of support is there out there? And how do we get the tools of democracy? How do we get the mobilization all over the country to push them into application? Whether they're through Congress, whether they're through our own community economies, whether they're through our own personal self-determination, neighbor to neighbor, accumulating 
across the country. So let's say uh, a lot of people think the tax system is nutty, crazy, overly complex, unfair, unreliable, wastes a lot of our time. How would we transform the tax system? Oh, this is an hour, but it's not going to take that long because I just have basically three suggestions here. One is a new principle of taxation, which says we first tax, before we tax labor, we first tax that which society likes the least or dislikes the most. Okay? So we tax pollution, carbon tax, and other taxes on pollution. Because we don't like pollution. It's a silent form of violence. It sickens us. It tarnishes the value of our property. So we would like to tax it uh, to bring it down. Second, we, we don't like the kind of speculation on Wall Street derivatives that had crashed the economy in 2008 and 9. Unemployed eight workers, fractured trillions of dollars of pension funds and mutual funds and people's savings, and then ended up with a taxpayer bailout in Washington, D.C. of Citigroup and Merrill Lynch and Washington Mutual and AIG and Morgan Stanley and J.P. Morgan Chase, all these giant corporations that knew right from the beginning they were too big to fail and they were going to be bailed out by Uncle Sam. Socialism bailing out communism. <laughs> a derivative, a tax on derivatives, a tax on stocks, comes off the huge volume of trading, computer driven trading, I think last year derivatives in terms of notional trades was 700 trillion. All right, well most people, they don't know about all this. Most people go into the stores every day and they buy clothing and they buy furniture and they buy necessities of life and they pay six, seven, eight, nine percent sales tax. But tomorrow somebody can buy a hundred million dollars of Exxon derivatives in Wall Street and pay not a penny. Now that's what's called appealing to liberal and conservative senses of fair play. Not a penny. Now if they have to pay one half of one percent, not six percent that you pay, seven percent, one half of one percent, that's three hundred billion dollars with a B. France, Germany, other countries, if they're not considering it, they already have a little, what they call stock transaction tax. We had one in the early 1900s. In fact, it still exists in New York State, but it's rebated every day electronically back to the brokers. New York State could have eliminated its deficit and then some if they simply stopped rebating it when it came pouring in every day from these transactions. So there's a little ditty here. First tax what we burn before we tax what we earn. First tax what we bet, speculation, gambling, before we tax what we net. Did you hear that on the presidential debate? <laughs> Second principle of transforming the tax system is equity. Why do we have 25 major corporations who last year paid zero federal income tax on billions and billions of profits U.S.-based? Verizon, General Electric. I just met a fellow from General Electric at Union Station. I said, what did you do? He said, I was in the CFO's office. I said, you've got quite a crack tax avoidance, could have been evasion too, uh, club there. He says, they're some of the smartest people in the company. He said, we actually give them prizes when they end up saving us from our tax responsibilities. We give them prizes. They have quotas. And year after year, General Electric has escaped more than any other company, making big money, escaping from federal income tax, and getting billions back from the Treasury. They get a check from the Treasury after they pay zero. The head of General Electric is Jeffrey Immelt. He has 
presided over a company exports more jobs than creates in this country. So he's a job exporter, and so he was nominated by President Obama to head the Jobs Council of the White House. Huh? He, he, he pays no federal income tax for his company. He pays more federal income tax than his giant corporation in dollars. And his income is larger, of course, than the income tax that his giant corporation pays, which is zero. The equity here goes to closing down tax havens, getting international tax compacts. There are other countries that would like to do it, but they don't want to do it if no one else does it. It involves getting rid of a lot of what are called loopholes, tax shelters for the wealthy. If we restore the tax system for corporations and the wealthy that we had in the 1960s, which were quite prosperous by conventional yardsticks, it would be to two, another two to three hundred billion dollars. So we're not talking about tax increase. We should be talking about a tax restoration. The third principle of transforming uh, our, our tax system is to simplify it. This will unemploy some bookkeepers, accountants, and tax lawyers. But we need to simplify it so we can collect more of it. Right now, $300 billion in taxes escapes in, in uh, income, escapes taxation, according to the U.S. Treasury. If we had a more simplified system, and I'm not going to go into details, but we certainly have a lot of good, uh, smart people who can show us how to do that, uh, we will collect those $300 billion, and if you add it all together, will be able to dramatically reduce the tax rate for 80% of the working families in this country, including those who now pay taxes and are making uh, a modest middle class income. All right, so the second is called making our communities more self-reliant. Uh, that's a simple one. That goes with a trend that is expanding. Every dollar we spend at a democratically run credit union or a community bank, every dollar we spend at a farmers to consumer marketplace that now offers food stamps because some of the prices are beyond the range of low income people, every dollar we spend supporting renewable energy, wind energy and others in our locality, Every dollar we spend at a community health clinic that is community-based and emphasizes prevention of disease and trauma, our dollars we take away from giant corporations and we reduce their sales. That's called the strategy of displacement. Now, we have tens of billions of dollars in these community economies going on now. Yes Magazine, how many of you have ever heard of Yes Magazine? They chronicle this very well around the country. But we need hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars of displacement money away from giant corporations whose strings are pulled far from our community, who can shut down and abandon our communities in place of community economies who are rooted in the community, are not going to shut down and go to China. They're not going to start speculating with your money because they have to face you every day. They're not in some skyscraper in London or New York, Chicago or Tokyo. Community economies, another solution. The third is giving science and technology back to the people. Look at all the science and technologies going on. We lead the world. Huge amount of it is working on ever more refined and reliable weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, physical, scientific brains, technological brains, not applied to modern public transit, not applied until recently to solar energy, not applied to building practices for efficiency, not applied to uh, advanced systems of sewage processing, water purification, not applied to Science and technology for the people. 
We need that. We need to redirect it. One way is to elaborate the role of citizen science, scientists. There are thousands now of citizen scientists. Uh, they're volunteering for environmental groups in Europe, East Asia, North America. What are they doing? Well, they're counting the number of seals that go into a certain bay in Canada. They can't hire people for that. They're measuring and detecting certain contaminants per billion parts um, for drinking water or soil contamination. The more citizen scientists there are, and they come from all ages, retired, students, people middle age, the more understanding there is of science and technology for the people. On October 24th, uh, S Center for Science and the Public Interest, which is an offshoot of one of our groups, led by Dr. Michael Jacobson from MIT, is having National Food Day. If you look it up, Center for Science and Public Interest, you will see exquisitely useful materials uh, that you can use and apply immediately, even though it's only two or three weeks away, uh, to have a food day that has its locale in the schools, in the community, in the stores, in the gardens, in your community. Right now, the food that is grown in backyard gardens in America, if it was given a retail sales price, over $20 billion. And it's just getting started. Science, technology for the people. Protect the family unit. I just picked one slice of that. The commercialization of childhood is out of control. When I was a child, the companies would maybe sell us directly bubble gum. But they never dared bypass our parents and undermine parental authority and go for the three-year-old, the four-year-old, the five-year-old, the six, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old selling junk food, junk drink, Watching the obesity epidemic grow among the young, the diabetic epidemic, the precursor of high blood pressure, and, and laughing all the way to the bank, these electronic corporate child molesters, laughing all the way to the bank. They would never sell this junk to their own children. And they add violent programming, two-way interactive violent programming. There was a Colonel Grossman who taught at West Point who was so appalled by this kind of marketing to children, the commercialization of childhood, the corporatization of child rearing while the parents are away on long commutes, one, two jobs. They put the guilt wrap on the parents by teaching the children how to nag. And the ads in Mad Madison Square Garden get the prizes for what they call a high nag factor. Hey, this is a child. This is an ad to the kids. It has a high parental nag factor. He was so appalled, Colonel Grossman. He writes this book, Teaching Our Children to Kill. We have to shield our children from commercialization of their daily lives. And the description here is one that all parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and neighbors can play a role in when they simply start asking the question, what are they doing to our children, their mental and physical health and the range of their horizons and how they no longer interact with other children as they spend more and more of their life looking at screens. Four, get corporations off welfare. That happens to be supported by liberals, Rep uh, Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, libertarians, but not corporatists. By the way, I, I have never met a corporatist who doesn't call herself or himself a conservative. But I've never met a conservative who calls themselves corporatists. They call it, on the right, crony capitalism. We call it corporate welfare. Subsidies, handouts, giveaways, bailouts, artificial quotas, contrary to market discipline, all kinds of governmental power and governmental tax-collected money to these giant profitable corporations. Without corporate welfare, you would not have seen some of the great industries in the country. But corporate welfare is defined as no quid pro quo to the taxpayer. Without government research and development, 
trillions of dollars in the last 60 years, you wouldn't recognize the biotech industry. You wouldn't recognize the containerization industry. You wouldn't know much about the, the semiconductor computer industry. The pharmaceutical industry would be half of what it is. Most of the anti-cancer drugs are funded by the National Institutes of Health, Nash, National Cancer Institute. You wouldn't recognize a lot of parts of our industry. The aerospace industry is a creation of the work done for the Air Force. And NASA spinoffs have created a lot of it. You ever see ads in the paper thanking the taxpayer by these corporate freeloaders? Uh, I once wrote to 100 of them and said, why don't you label April 15th Taxpayer Appreciation Day? <laughs> Thank the taxpayers. I didn't get much of a response. But if we are going to engage in taxpayer providing of these profitable giant corporations, we need to have conditions. We need to have reasonable price restraints, for example, on cancer drugs. Huh? Our tax dollars develop, test, clinically approve these cancer drugs. They give them away free to Bristol Myers Squibb and Pfizer, and they can charge us whatever they want. They were charging a woman with ovarian cancer who wrote me in the year 2000 $14,000 for six treatments. And, and, and Bristol Myers Squibb didn't spend a penny discovering this or engaging in the clinical testing before sales. The taxpayers did that through the National Cancer Institute. Cracking down on corporate crime, that's an easy one. Who hasn't heard and read and felt the corporate crime wave? Credit card, debit card, price fixing, unapproved, unapproved sales of drugs. The government's gone after some of those. Huge fines, four, five, six hundred million dollars for per drug company. But they just come back because they make 15 billion and they have to pay a billion in fine. This is a pretty small cost of doing business. And none of the executives go to jail. They're not prosecuted. These are fines on the company. We live in a corporate crime wave. And the enforcement budget is trivial. Imagine a corporate crime wave uh, with very few federal cops on the corporate crime beat. And this is a question most uh, investigative reporters never ask. They never go and ask the state attorney general, or they ask the U.S. attorney general, or the EPA, or the Food and Drug Administration, how many investigators do you have for all the ripping off of Medicare and, and Medicaid by uh, the health industry? How many do you have in the antitrust division to stop price fixing? or other collusive behavior. How about your Environmental Crimes Division? Last I heard in the Justice Department, they had under 100 lawyers in the Environmental Crimes Division. Corporate pollution, violating laws, corporate crime, silent form of deadly violence. So one of the solutions here is not just more disclosure, automatically d disclose this information by corporations not just more subpoena power by regulatory agencies, but more enforcement. The way the corporations get off the hook is they go to Congress and they make sure that the law enforcement budgets are trivial so there are fewer federal cops on the corporate crime, fraud, and abuse B, Create national charters for national corporations. That one was proposed over 100 years ago by President Teddy Roosevelt and President William Howard Taft. So all we got to do is go backwards into the future. But right now, these giant corporations are created by state charter. Investors do not create corporations. They finance them. They are given, these corporations are given their life, their perpetual life, their limited liability for their investors. They are given their existence their very existence as artificial entities, they are not people, as artificial entities by state governments for the most part. State charter. It's pretty automatic, but it's the way we can condition behavior, just like they can condition your driver's license. Just think of this. We have giant corporations now, global. They pit government against government to their advantage. They strategically plan about everything that 
we do in life, that's what they do. They don't have to conspire. If we were a strong resistance, they would have to conspire. How do you do conspire against passivity, lassitude? Okay, so Monsanto is strategically planning your genetic future and moving to get more and more patents on human gene sequences and genetic material in our vegetarian and subhuman animal world. They're planning the genetic future. Exxon and Peabody Coal, they're planning our energy future. Pfizer and Bristol-Myers Squibb, they're planning our medical treatment future, along with Hospital Corporation of America. General Electric is planning a lot of our medical device future. All these corporations are planning our political future, our electoral future, supporting, opposing, now without limit, under Citizens United, uh, candidates they like or don't like. They certainly have planned our government. This is a corporate government. I talk to civil servants. I'll say, tell me one government agency or department to which the question, the answer to the question, who is the most powerful outside lobbying force on your agency or department? Defense, Treasury, FDA, Interior, Agriculture. That is not corporate. They couldn't come up with one. Not even the Department of Labor. And these corporations are pumping huge money into the campaigns of our legislators, and they are also putting their officials, their corporate executives in high government positions. We need to rewrite the compact between the people and the corporations. That's why it's important to talk about federal charters for large corporations. Restore our civil liberties. I don't have to tell this audience what the Patriot Act has done. I don't have to tell this audience how presidents of whichever party can round people up and arrest them without charges and throw them in jail, sometimes indefinitely, make it hard for them to get attorneys. I don't have to tell this audience of busboys and poets that have heard people who have seen and witnessed and suffered from the transgression of their civil liberties and civil rights, how important it is to combine with conservatives and libertarians who are also very concerned about invasions of privacy, invasions of due process, the end of something called probable cause, and a right of trial by jury, and a presumption of innocence. We now have a president who, like his predecessor, but he has more drones to play with, who every Tuesday morning is given the recommendations as to who lives and who dies in remote countries overseas. And he decides courageously which button to push, and seconds later, people disappear and are vaporized. Oh, some of them are suspects. Suspects of what? Trying to overthrow tyrants? in their country that we still back, trying to protect their valley, trying to protect customs we may not like. That's why they're vaporized. And what if there are other people right near them? What if their family is near them? They're vaporized. We are having our power used this way we are having our name used this way by unconstitutional acts of criminal aggression where the President of the United States has declared he will kill anybody in the world, including American citizens, who he and his advisors suspect is a threat, not even an imminent threat, it seems, to our country. So we now have a president who is arrogated to himself, as George Bush and Dick Cheney have before him, the role of prosecutor, judge, jury, executioner, and cover-upper. This is in the land of the free, home of the brave, under the Bill of Rights, a constitution that has not been technically repealed. Where's our level of constitutional indignation here? We think, 
We think we can get away with it because we're all powerful, the, the world's leading empire. We're banking a lot of revenge out there. We're banking a lot of revenge that's going to come back to haunt us. We are very vulnerable. We know it. And we've got to recover. And it's time for us to become a humanitarian superpower. We've got so much to offer the world. Not a humanitarian, military superpower. Use government procurement to spur innovation. I remember when the Department of Transportation would not mandate airbags in your cars. So I went down to the General Services Administration back in the mid-80s under Ronald Reagan. The General Services Administration buys about 40,000 motor vehicles for government employees every year. The customer is always right, I told the administrator, who happened to be Gerald Carman, who was an auto supply businessman from New Hampshire. That's just what you want for someone not to be in awe of the auto companies in Detroit. And he said, why not? I'll save some lives of our federal employees. And he put out for bid X number of car order, orders with a spec saying airbags. And GM didn't bid. Chrysler didn't bid. Ford bid. That broke the ground. After that, they all came on board. So if you use government procurement, uh, and government buys almost everything we buy, plus, you know, submarines and missiles that we don't buy. But they buy paper. They buy food. They buy construction materials. They buy energy. They buy food. As I said, food, they buy motor vehicles, they buy equipment of all kinds that we use. And why can't they spur the innovation, create the new civilian markets by upgrading their specifications? You know, a lot of companies want to sell to the government. If they have to sell upgraded, consumer, safer, environmentally benign products, they're more likely to turn to their civilian customers. The person who had that idea early was the greatest environmentalist of the 20th century who just passed away, Barry Commoner. He told the Pentagon 30 years ago, if you buy photovoltaics for your remote locations, you will spur innovation and you will help create a civilian economy for it much faster than the case would be. That's another solution. Federal, state, and local purchasing is over two and a quarter trillion dollars this year. The customer is always right. We also want to reinvest in public works. That's called infrastructure. If you get rid of a lot of corporate welfare, if you renovate the tax system, if you crack down on corporate crime, you will liberate resources that can be put back into repairing in every community in America with good paying jobs that can't be exported to China. Our schools, crumbling, highways, bridges need repair. Sewage, drinking water systems need upgrading and modernization. How many people in the District of Columbia without even knowing for four years were drinking water with lead in it about 10 years ago? We need to rebuild our dams. We need to rebuild our public buildings, our courthouses. And we're not doing it because we're blowing apart with our tax money instead Iraq and Afghanistan. Two billion dollars a week goes to blowing apart and making more enemies in Afghanistan. Two billion a week, at least. So we need that. That is the way to create good paying jobs that, that are real, that actually improve life in every community in America. We need to get funds for this by reducing our military budget. Do you know our military budget is higher in real dollars than it was during the Cold War when we were facing Soviet missiles? It's now $800 billion, including the, the wars of choice in Iraq and Afghanistan. By the way, 70% of the American people won out of Afghanistan yesterday. If we cut that military budget, which is now $800 billion, to six, five, four, General McPeak, retired of the Air Force, said a while back, if we can't defend the USA on $300 billion, we better get a new set of generals. 
we liberate that money. We bring the soldiers from those bases all over the world of our empire who are just agitating and making people hate us, including our allies like in Okinawa off of the mainland of Japan. We're still there. Huge bases. And put it back. Get the soldiers tuition free college and community college education and put it back into our public works. We need to re-engage with civic life. That's the key, isn't it? How do you get these things rolling? How do you get the train moving without the engine and the fuel of collaborative citizens in every congressional district, which I'll get to in a moment? We need 14 to organize congressional watchdog groups. Now, this is one that's very modest. Congress is the most powerful branch of our three branches. They don't use some of that power, but they have the taxing power, the spending power, the war declaration power, the investigating power, the confirmation power, on and on. They are the smallest branch of our government. We don't have to deal with millions of executive branch employees. We don't have to deal with judges there for life in the courtroom. We deal with little Congress, 535 men and women who put on their shoes every day like you and I do. And they dream every day of getting votes. <laughs> but they've figured out that the way to get votes is first to gerrymander districts so that either the Democrat wins easily or the Republican wins easily, sometimes without even an opponent. Have you heard of Speaker John Boehner? Here's how smart the Democrats are. They have made sure that in southwest Ohio, John Boehner does not have a Democratic opponent. So it's pretty easy for most of these people to get reelected. A lot of them have no opponents. More of them have nominal opponents of the major party. Never mind the Green Party, our Libertarian Party, Justice Party, Constitution Party. They know how to marginalize small parties, keep them out of debates, wear them down with ballot access obstacles. So what are we doing about our member of Congress? We've got to ask ourselves some important questions. Answer this one for me. Please be candid. Someone who is your neighbor, let's say, knocks on your door, says, hi, I'm your new neighbor. I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. you got a minute. See, put down your little iPhone. Turn off the TV. Uh, I spend 23% of your income. I can let all kinds of companies rip you off, unemploy you, underinsure you, disrespect you, invade your privacy, and expose you to toxic chemicals. I can raise your taxes or lower your taxes. I can send your children off to war by just letting the president do it without even having to declare it. Tito, just thought I'd let you know, and walks down the little pathway. What are you going to say to that person? That's your congressman, by the way, your senator or representative. What are you going to say? Why you? I was going to text message six. Or are you going to say, come back here. You mean something to me. So I better mean something to you. Now, how many people here spend more time watching Congress than they spend watching themselves in the mirror throughout the year? Throughout the year. Don't all raise your hands. That's the problem. I'm told there are 15 million serious bird watchers. You know what a serious bird watcher is? Okay, up at dawn, into the marshes, never mind the weather, binoculars, camera, pad, pen, tabulation, elated emails and text messages when they come back. I'm up to 48. I'm going to catch you. You're at 73. And that woodpecker wasn't different. You're double counting. These are serious people. 
It's a healthy habit. Here's what it takes to turn Congress around. If you have an agenda with these kinds of solutions that are supported by a majority of the people, however passively, included often liberals and conservatives and libertarians, 20% of the number of people and the number of hours that serious bird watchers spend watching birds directed to watching Congress. Okay, how do you get it going? One way is to realize that most people don't show up anymore. Half a democracy is showing up. So when the members of Congress have town meetings back home, do you know what the big problem is, other than the August of 2009 when the Tea Party people showed up? The big problem is, don't put too many seats there. You're lucky if you get three dozen people, barring some hot, timely issue. So let's say you can demonstrate to your senator and representative that you can fill a high school auditorium with 300 people you will have that representative and senator on the stage at the earliest convenience. That's what it takes. Is that a big deal? Of course not. Not if you go neighbor to neighbor, not if you know how to converse, not if you know how to generate a little fire in the belly, and not if you know how to give a cutting edge to what they're thinking about what's wrong and what needs to be put right anyway. Now, once you get your senator and representative, Let's say we do this in 435 districts. Say it's like an Earth Day event. And let's say we say the only subject for this event, Senator, Representative, is excessive corporate power. We're not discussing anything else. You better come prepared. That simple series of events will become, become changing the corridor talk, will become encouraging the good people in Congress to start having hearings, to start putting in bills. They're afraid of the people, but the people aren't making them give cause to be afraid of the people in a constructive way. If people showed them some rumble out there, you would see these lobbyists, these swarming lobbyists of about 1,500 corporations who don't have a single vote but get their way with the majority of the Congress start having second thoughts about what they need to do. So once you get people in the room, you get their names. That becomes the core of the beginning of the Congress watchdog groups. The target is 1,000 to 2,000 in every congressional district which has 650,000 people. Is that too much? Do you know how much, how many people show up for high school football games? 1,000 to 200 to 2,000, serious people. Every congressional district has colleges, community colleges, people of good intent who are frustrated, who don't know how to connect. Okay, so let's say, say you have 1,000 to 2,000. What are you building on that? You pledge 200 hours each of volunteer time around all these redirections, these solutions, you agree ahead of time, and you establish two offices with four full-time people in each congressional district by raising or contributing each a couple hundred dollars. You know, dinner for four at a decent restaurant once a year. You will see what I mean when I say it's a lot easier than you think. The reason why we do not have a strong democratic society in this country are many. But one reason is that we grow up being told in a hundred ways we are powerless. We're told you can't fight City Hall. You can't take on Exxon. You want a job, you better shut up. Just shut up and shop is what George W. Bush told us prior to the invasion of Iraq. You are told that because there is no countervailing telling you that you count, you matter, a few people make a difference, look at our history, all the major social justice movements started with a handful of people. Six women in upstate New York, 1847, the women's suffrage movement, handful of workers in the sit-down strikes in Michigan, 
to build the United Auto Workers, put their entire livelihood on the ground at risk in the late 30s. And what about Rosa Parks? Talk about someone who started a multiplier effect in Montgomery, Alabama, when she refused to go to the rear of the bus? How many times do we have to be told that every social justice movement starts with one or two people? But we have far more than that in our country. And of those 1,000 and 2,000, you're going to see attorneys, community organizers, communicators, graphic artists, people in the healthcare industry, social industry, people who simply know how to go up and down their street and mobilize the neighbors that they've played poker with or bowled with. People know how to connect if they see something at the end of the tunnel, if they see a reason for them to step forward, locking arms with other people. There are three little ones here, which I, I will summarize very quickly. But the congressional, the congressional watchdog is one of the tools. I'm not going to go into the other tools, but you can dream all you want. You can have the best directions, and you can have the best polls if you don't have the civic tools that we can use, and you can use. We're not going to get past first base to home plate. One of them is simply this. Every community has very rich people. Most of them could give a darn about strengthening our democracy. They're into their own lives and spoiling their grandchildren, maybe, by giving them too much money. But there are always 1, 2, 3 percent who are in their 70s, 80s, 90s, have a different perspective on life than just getting richer. They want to look their grandchildren in the eye. They're worried about our country. They're worried about our world. And I don't think we spend enough time with these people. There are a lot of rich people who give to charity. But a society that has more justice is a society that needs less charity. And while they may give to soup kitchens, why do we have millions of people and children? Hungry? In the richest country in the world? Justice addresses the prevention of hunger. And so I have one of these 17 solutions is find the enlightened super rich. I can show Warren Buffett, who's, who's leading reform, is tax reform. As you know, he, he pays a lower tax rate than his secretary, and he's told senators that. I can show him for $1.25 billion, we can get transformative tax reform in the U.S. Congress in three years or less. Now, he's worth $52 billion. He gives $3 billion a year to the Gates Foundation, uh, in which he's on the board. And do you know how many billions of dollars can be saved and redirected with tax reform every month? We have to think big if we're going to achieve long overdue big direct big change reforms in our country. Last one is getting on the field, literally. We have a League of Fans group. We have turned into a nation of spectators, of fewer and fewer superb athletes who get more and more money. And while we watch them, we eat and we drink. And most of us are not chewing on carrots or drinking nutritious smoothies. And so we get bigger and heavier and more out of shape. And so many of us are watching sports that the city officials say, why expand and upgrade neighborhood recreation facilities? Even the kids are watching. In middle school, they sort themselves out and they watch their superior athletes instead of play themselves. We need unorganized sports. We need unprofessional sports. We need activities as simple as sandlot softball or baseball. We need activities as simple as having a hoop by the garage and using it more with the kids. We need a connection with the ages. 
with grandmothers and grandfathers playing a little bit with their grandchildren and children. That's why the last one is called Get Back in the Field. It will save lives. It will prevent anguish. It will lengthen lives. It will save health care dollars. And when you are more in shape physically, you're more likely to be in shape intellectually and civically because you won't be diverted. So this book is designed to be read, digested, add to it yourself, your own ideas, your own strategies, your own tactics, get motivated. If it doesn't motivate you, it's not because of what's in this book, because you agree with a lot of what's in this book. It's because you've given up on yourself. It's because you're in your own routine and you're not willing to change it. It's because you're otherwise preoccupied. And if you don't become civically occupied, you will indeed be otherwise preoccupied with more and more personal stresses, pressures, damages, and all the things that come with living in a society where the concentration of power in the hands of the few, our power in the hands of the few, it starts with we the people, doesn't it, in the Constitution, not we the corporation. Our power in the hands of the few, politically, and corporately that are used against us and are rendered decisions that are against our own self-interest and that of our own posterity. You're interested in this book, we will also give you this book appropriately called Calling All Radicals by mean, meaning fundamental, people who are fundamental, not symptomatic. And it's subtitled How Grassroots Organizers Can Help Save Our Democracy. I entertain your questions. If you want my weekly column free electronically, visit nader.org. If you want to see what all our groups are doing, Public Citizen, Alan Morrison is here, who won a lot of Supreme Court cases for the, Supreme, for the Public Citizen Litigation Group. If you want to know that, there are two simple websites, essential.org, essential.org. And the other one is citizen.org. You can see how early we got that domain name, <laughs> citizen.org. Get involved, get your friends, neighbors, co-workers involved. Remember, we have far more solutions supported by a majority of the people and we apply to the problems and injustices on the ground. That democracy gap can be filled by us, small numbers of us. It's a lot easier than we think, as long as we have the public sentiment, as Abraham Lincoln pointed out, behind us. Thank you very much. Before we have questions, yeah, we're going to have questions now. Yeah, thank you. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, please wait for the mic. I'll come around. Um, please keep your questions and comments very short so we can get in as many as possible in a short amount of time. Um, one quick announcement. Um, we are going to do the book signing right here at this front table, so we'll ask you to make your way to the bookstore, purchase Ralph Nader's book, get the free book by Gabe Thompson, um, bring them back to this room. We'll do the signing in this room. Um, when we do the signing, we'll ask you to line up along the mural side of the room, across the front, and to this table. Um, that's all I have. I want to thank C-SPAN's Book TV for coming out, and we'll start right over here with the questions. Um, Mr. Nader, I have one question. Why don't you run for president? <laughs> that's a rhetorical question. I've run several times, as most of you know, and uh, yeah, there's some good candidates now, third party candidates. Uh, Green Party, Jill Stein, Rocky Anderson, Justice Party, and uh, others of a more conservative persuasion that are on the ballot to give voters uh, more choice. We've documented through litigation and our writings that this is a rather vicious two party duopoly that doesn't want competition and increasingly calls for the same campaign dollars. So they become less and less different, especially on corporate issues and foreign and military uh, policy. 
So I hope that a lot of you will run for local office, state office, national office. Uh, try to run on third parties if you uh, want to bring your conscience to your task. And uh, it's easier to get on the ballot at the local, and that's where it really it needs to start, build up to the Nash state and the national. Anybody? Yes. I have a question. Uh, you talked about excuses earlier, how people uh, give different excuses. But uh, we all watched you and your political career. And uh, in a way, uh, you ran for president several times also. So one of the excuses was everything is rigged against the third party candidate. Everything is rigged against uh, an outsider. And your in some, in your political career seems to be an example of that, that everything was rigged against you. Um, what do you have to say about that? First of all, we have to demonstrate it because you don't want them to get away with theory. You don't want them uh, to say, oh, how do you know it's rigged? Uh, you know, we, we, we have a free country. Well, you, you, you show that by challenging them and their fangs come out. And all these bad state laws begin to be invoked. And more and more people learn about it and get upset. So we did get a lot of young people interested in clean election organizing. They're going to be heard from in the future. Uh, we certainly reached tens of millions of people on how rigged it was. Um, but the fact that you knock on the door, the steel door, it doesn't open the first time, second time, third time, it'll open. You've got to keep knocking on the door. And if you knock on it at the local level, you're going to open the national level, as I said, uh, quicker. You know, there are senators who waited decades before their reform was enacted. Um, there are pe people, look how long the women's suffrage and the abolition movement. I'm not saying we should wait that long. We've been waiting for single payer uh, for, since Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but uh, I, what I am saying is if you, if you lose the first time, uh, you want to try and try again. I mean, unless you're willing to lose, you will never win when you're fighting... Uh, powerful uh, forces. You've got to be willing to lose, bounce back, get more resources, and keep going. Hi, Amir, I have a question. Yes, um, yes. You did... Sorry. Uh, you, you sort of briefly mentioned campaign finance reform. I'm wondering if you could elaborate on that. I see it didn't fit into one of your 17 solutions, but just uh, maybe further elaboration on the importance of that? Well, you see now there are PACs and super PACs and corporations under Citizen United that can, United that can flood uh, the elections in our country, local, state, national. And I think uh, you, you do have to find a way to get full public financing of public campaigns, either through the unlikely event of a Supreme Court revisit of some of their three or four notorious decisions in the past, or through constitutional amendment, or through intermediate ways, like saying, if you want to do business company with the U.S. government, you cannot avail yourself of unlimited independent expenditures under Citizen United. Maybe that will work, uh, but we've got to find ways to do it. I, I can tell you most politicians don't like to grovel for money, but they do it because it pays off for them against a potential challenger or, or the desired no challenge election and re-election. So uh, if you start doing this piecemeal, and sometimes that's all you can get through, the, the gamesmen are brilliant at designing around the restriction. They'll design around McCain-Feingold, They'll try to defeat it in the Supreme Court. Part of it, they'll establish something like Citizens United. They'll override state laws that prevent corporations from directly giving money for elections. So it, that's why we've got to get a very, very fundamental effort here, public funding of public campaigns. And a lot of the money people raise could be replaced by giving them a certain amount of free time on licensed radio and television stations. That is, uh, we give them the license free to use our property 24 hours a day. We're the landlord, they're the tenants, they get it free. We can say, no, no, 
you have to now give a certain amount of free time before elections to ballot qualified candidates. That, that, that will reduce a lot of the uh, pressure to raise more and more money because that's where a lot of it goes. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I wanted to thank you for bringing up the uh, United States unauthorized use of drones against uh, so many of our code friends. Uh, you know, pack, we have uh, 35 members of Code Pink in, in Pakistan today who are working and marching with uh, people from Waziristan, uh, Imran Khan, leading uh, to protest uh, the use of United States drones in Pakistan. But uh, on this piece, uh, so often, Ralph, you have used um, the use of 2,000 people per congressional uh, uh, constituency. And I think that's a really powerful idea. And I'm wondering if, have I missed in, in the things that I've read of what you've written, um, is there uh, is there an organization helping us do that? Is there software that we can flow, or are we kind of need to initially make it up ourselves? I mean, is there an organization that's, that um, that has more details about how we would organize this and structure it? Well, there are a lot of good manuals, <coughs> videos, as you know, on how to do this and that, how to uh, diffuse your member of Congress record in ways the member may not want, how to put on a news conference, how to use the Free Information Act, how to build coalitions. We tried this Congress watchdog idea once. We didn't have the resources to put into it, but what happened was the people who came forward were already active, and so they had their own local issues, and, and they had trouble focusing on congressional issues because the local issues kept bubbling up for their attention. Uh, no, I, I don't know anyone who's really doing this, the pieces of it, there are a lot of people doing it, the, the pieces, but the, the, the techniques. But something the labor unions could run with, uh, something some of the other national groups can run with together. My favorite one is to try to price it out for the first year. It prices out at about $100 million. Find a, find a, a mega billionaire who wants to make a historical record for herself or himself and uh, you know they give away a couple hundred billion, million here two billion there now uh, to jump start it it would be nice to always oh, start at the grassroots and, and maybe it could be done through some media campaign uh, it is labor intensive there's no doubt about it there needs to be maybe three or four pilots um, uh, but once the first victories come uh, you will see people standing at the door at the doorway trying to sign up to the 2,000 people in each congressional district. Yes, Ralph, I've uh, admired you for so many years. I do have a hard question. Uh, if we could show that Arab and Muslim people are not the culprits for the attacks of 9-11, uh, wouldn't that undercut the Islamophobia being used to foment our current imperial ventures and undercut the xenophobia being used to take away our civil liberties? Well, of course. I mean, the whipping people into a frenzy like on Iran and before on Iraq comes from a widespread feeling uh, that that ethnic uh, religious group was, as a whole, uh, deeply implicated and supportive, uh, which, of course, is entirely false. And... Politicians like Cheney and uh, Bush, uh, to this day, tried to give the impression that Saddam Hussein was involved with 9-11 uh, when he was mortal enemies with Al-Qaeda. He was secular. They were uh, religious, so-called. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is quite clear. I mean, to, to get a mobilized base of hysteria behind criminal wars of aggression, you've got to deal with successful stereotyping of whole groups. Okay, we have time for one more question. I pulled this gentleman up here. He could have it. Two more quick announcements. Um, I just learned that there's a website for, for this book, um, 17solutions.com. It's dot .com. Not That's dot right. If you, if you want an autographed copy for a gift you give somebody, sometimes they're more willing to read it. Uh, don't ask me why. <laughs> uh, if you uh, visit 17traditions.com, spell out 17 traditions. Excuse me. There's also a book, 17 Traditions. Yeah. That came out at the same time. 
www.solutions.com and you can order an autographed copy. But if you want to buy the book here in our bookstore, it's operated by Teaching for Change. All proceeds do help keep an independent, progressive, nonprofit bookstore alive in D.C. So we'll ask you, in, after one last question, to make your way to the bookstore and get the books. And, and it'll, uh, it'll be and personalized. It. And it'll be personalized. Personalized, not just autographed. And you get this free. This is a real crackerjack book, Calling All Radicals. You, you revisit our history of really courageous people. Uh, it tends to be very motivating when you see they did all this without electricity and motor vehicles and telephones and didn't even have email. Hi. Yes. Yes. Hello, how are you? Hi. Thanks for uh, being here. <clears throat> so I've been a, a follower and supporter for uh, some time now. And um, I haven't yet purchased the book. I intend to. But I want to, just on the presentation today, um, I sensed uh, an elevated tone, at least at the opening and then again at the closing of a challenge to all of us in the in the room, particularly people 30 and under, but all of us, in the room, out of the room, everyone, uh, the American citizenry in general, and I wonder if that's an intentional and conscious thing, and, and, and if I'm right, am I, am I right that, um, that there is an elevated challenge uh, to, for us to get out of the passivity and the, the apathy and to, and to get involved, it, it's sort of even mocking some of the uh, personal emphasis for comfort and the lack of civic engagement. So, Yes, I couldn't have put it better. Uh, it's very, very right. That's what I'm trying to convey. Uh, I could add to it, because uh, you came right to that point. It's a lot of fun to advance and achieve justice. I mean, it really is very gratifying. It's not just, oh, it's really tough, it's hard work. It is, but it's a lot of fun. Uh, so. Ask Alan Morrison how he felt when he won the unanimous decision on legislative veto. It was unanimous, wasn't it? What? Close, sorry. In the Supreme Court. They had a great party. I mean, it was unbelievable. It, it, it overturned more provisions than, than, any, than all other uh, Supreme Court decisions declaring legislative items uh, unconstitutional, right? Okay, see, so it's fun. You don't do it because it's fun. You, you do it because it's necessary, and if it's necessary and important, it, it's fun. The important thing about this, uh, this book is you can intersect it piecemeal. You can pick and choose. You know, if you want to deal with establishing a agribusiness displacing farmer to consumer market in your community as spreading around the country, offering food stamps for low-income people, you can do that. If you want to start a civic skill course in your schools, so the students in middle school and high school learn uh, civic skills and experience between the classroom and the community, not just computer skills, they actually engage in reality, not just looking at screens, you can do it. So it's a pick and choose as well as an overall um, comprehensive approach that deals not only with where we should go, how to get there, and what the tools that we can grab to organize ourselves for the requisite civic power. Okay. Uh, on behalf of us boys and boys and teaching for change, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Let's thank Ralph Nader one more time. Thank you very much. For more information about Ralph Nader and his book, visit 17solutions.com.